could find such a love at our age. Whoever thought we could dance on a plane. Welcome to Couples Therapy in Seven Words. I am your co-host, Judy Alexander, and I'm here with my husband, Dr. Bruce Chalmer. Well, hello, Judy. Hello, viewers and listeners. Judy, before we even address the title of today's really, I think, interesting uh, episode, mm -hmm. Uh, for the benefit of viewers, you might want to explain what the heck's on your nose. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like to say you got a little too frisky in bed the other night, but <laughs> it's nothing quite that fun. It's not that spicy, no, is it? No, no, no. I had no. I had to have some Mohs surgery on a basal cell carcinoma right in the middle of my nose. So I had this a couple of days ago, so I've got this huge bandage on for those who are listening, those who are seeing it, you'll have no problem seeing it. <laughs> it's pretty, and, and I will note, remember we saw Governor Kathy Hochul of the state of New York. Yes. We live next door in, in uh, Vermont, but you know, we saw her on TV announcing last week right. that she was gonna be having, lo and behold, a, a Mohs surgery on her, you know, for removing a basal cell carcinoma from her nose. Right. And she doesn't have any bandage at all. What's the deal? I know. I look at her. I'm saying she looks like that, and there's nothing on her nose. And I've got this huge, uh, you know, Bozo yeah. the Clown bandage. Well, it's it's white, not red. Yes. But <laughs> I think it. I suspect uh, the spot that she was dealing with must have been on the like on the side uh, or something. Well, she a, did point to the side, but she still has nothing there. So I don't yeah. understand how they could remove that when you know they had to slice me and dice me and do now, all sort and stitch me and do all sorts of things like that. Let me say, for the benefit of, of viewers and listeners who might have you know be worrying about having the surgery, I, I they let me be in. This is this is as surgery goes. Mm -hmm. You know, you were wide awake, of course. Yes, it was all of local course. anesthesia. And as surgery goes, I was I found it amazingly fascinating. Uh -huh. I thought I would be, you know, creeped out or something. It wasn't at all. And they were thanks to the doctors at the you know, University of Vermont Medical Center, because they seemed to be very competent mm -hmm. and very caring about you. I think yes, they took they good were. care of you. Yes, they did. And um and it was really fascinating to see. So they, you know, they did a good job. And Thank God, basal cell carcinoma, if you have to have something in the cancer family, right. it's the one to have. Right. And it's stage yeah. one, so we caught it really early, so. Yeah. And it, it comes from, so folks, use sunscreen. That's the Use sunscreen. <laughs> in fact, not only use sunscreen, use sunscreen when you're a teenager. Yes. So that yes. when you're in your 60s, you don't have to have, you don't have, to have this. <laughs> exactly. So, anyway, uh, let's get on with right the show. Along. So our topic for today is tantric dating mating and relating an interview with Catherine Amon. Yes, and Catherine was really fascinating, I think, about mm -hmm. uh, Tantra. And we, I, I personally had some, uh, I mean, I, we always learn, of course, from uh -huh. our, the folks we interview. I learned some things about Tantra I just never occurred to me. Me too. Among other things, a little spoiler alert, the way that she was describing what Tantra is all about is fits almost perfectly with my definition of faith. I it's know, really interesting. It's right up there with your philosophy, huh? Yeah, it was really so quite interesting. So you've been the, this Tantra master all this time and you didn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> I, it. I wouldn't go that far. But in any case, you know, fascinating stuff. And so uh, do uh, tune in. Mm -hmm. uh, before we go there, though, we got to tout our books. Yes, we do. Yes, yes so yes, tell we folks do. about some books. What well, you start with. Well, you know, we've been... Uh, Plugging your latest book, Absolutely. Betrayal and Forgiveness, How to Navigate the Turmoil and Learn to Trust Again. Which is starting to sell pretty well, I have it to say. It is, it is. It's uh, getting good reviews and it's getting good uh, sales. So it's uh, very timely. There's, you know, everybody, well, time I don't know, everybody's always being betrayed or has been betrayed or there's always a betrayal in somebody's life. And or, or know somebody who's been betrayed. In fact, you know, it was interesting that uh, when we did a book signing. Right, we just um, did one did at a book Barnes & Noble's this past weekend. Week, and among the folks who came by, uh, you know, most of the folks who came by were sort of in our age demographic. Yeah. Uh, but then there were these two separate young folks. Yeah, and They yeah. seemed to be like in their 20s yeah. at the most. You know, I don't think uh -huh. they were teenagers. They're yeah, in their no, 20s. They like they were, yeah. And it was fascinating. And one of, one of them actually was saying, gee, I want to, can I get this for my mother? <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I said, I forgot how he said it exactly, but I said something to the effect of, you know, if you're feeling like you want to give it to your mother, maybe you would benefit from it too. You know, and <laughs> she looked at it and she, she bought she it. Bought, yeah, <laughs> she said, oh yeah, uh, because it's that sense of how do you cope with 
hard stuff that happens in families it and couples stuff, and, and a lot uh, of stuff goes on yeah. um, oh you know i hear it from friends all the time yeah, absolutely from their children from their parents from siblings from friends yeah, yeah. and and this book uh, among other things i i certainly think and people have said among other things it'll give you hope it'll mm -hmm. give you a sense of okay this is really hard i don't i don't uh, trivialize it i don't pull any punches you know of course it's hard uh, but you can get through it. There are ways right. you can get through it. And, and just, it helps you. you know, forgiving does mm -hmm. not mean forgetting. People it think certainly that, doesn't. you know, you have to forget. You're not going to forget. But you can yeah. forgive. And it, it not only doesn't mean forgetting, it doesn't mean letting somebody off the hook. It doesn't mean trusting you. Right. You right. can forgive somebody you don't trust and you'll feel better and then you can figure out what to do. Right. Uh, but yes, so do get a hold of my book. And my other books, too. You'll find those on Amazon. And yes, and the other books, too. Oh, there's here, here comes some now. <laughs> Reigniting the Spark, Why Stable Relationships Lose Intimacy and How to Get It Back. Which, a chapter of which I mentioned in our in the interview right, you're all about to see. It came up in our interview. The, the, the chapter on sex, intimacy. Good Sex and Sacred Sex yeah. is in there. And then there's also... It's not about communication. Why everything you know about couples therapy is wrong. Indeed. And, of course... Well, we you, already plugged my book. Well, they, the people haven't seen the interview yet. Up. Oh, that's, that's right. true. Yes. So if you... <laughs> stay tuned for the interview because it does come up. The Blue Tent Erotic Tales from the Bible by Laria Zilber. Absolutely. So let's get to the interview let's and we'll, the interview. we will see you on the other side. Our guest today is Catherine Amon. Catherine is a licensed psychotherapist with advanced training in both traditional and spiritual psychology with 30 years of experience helping thousands of clients. Catherine's books include Tantric Dating, Tantric Mating, and Tantric Relating. She offers online workshops and trainings helping singles and couples create true love. Catherine, welcome to Couples Therapy in Seven Words. Thanks so much. I'm so happy to be here. Well, we're delighted to have you. Uh, we always like to ask our guests, how did you get into the work that you do? Tell us something about your own journey into this work. Well, um, like many psychotherapists, I had a difficult childhood, so I had to be in therapy for a long time to uh, heal myself from that. And I was in it so long, I thought, I really like this therapy process and I made some progress, so I think I'd like to learn how to help other people with that. And in terms of the Tantra and relationships, um, that really started, I was in a bookstore in the late 70s, and I saw this book that said sex is spiritual, and I went, doing. <laughs> of course it is. How do you spell is. that, doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like, of course it is. Uh -huh. It totally makes sense to me. What else would it be? So I started on this journey. There wasn't as much information back then. When I started on this journey of trying to find out what that meant that sex was spiritual. And it's uh, led me some very interesting places in my life. Such as? Um, well, I um, lived in a Tantra ashram in India for a year. And that was a full-time immersion in Tantra and meditation. Uh -huh. And I've studied with... Um, probably all of the big name Tantra teachers. I've taken workshops with them, classes. And now I have uh, written, so, as you mentioned, several books with Tantric themes. And I'm now working on my PhD in what's uh, at CIIS in what is called transpersonal psychology. And I'm studying transpersonal sex. Uh -huh. people so does, have, I'm sorry. No, how, does, just, how does Tantra meditation differ from other forms such as transcendental meditation or... Well, some of the meditations we did there were very active. So we would uh, get our bodies very oxygenated, getting a deep breathing. We would dance and um, do these kinds of things because um, Osho, our teacher, said that Western people, if we try to sit down and meditate, our minds just start the monkey mind. Mm -hmm. And basically, we're just sitting there in our own stew. <laughs> for 15 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever. And he said, if you can get the energy into the body, hmm. then it's more likely once you're exhausted that your mind will actually go quiet, which is what we're looking for in meditation. Hmm. And also Tantra is very much about our awareness being in the body and not just in our heads. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's one of the reasons like meditation never appealed to me because like to me just to sit down <laughs> Like you're right, the the mind just wanders and goes in all different directions, and 
yeah, the, the physical thing sounds like something I might be able to get into. <laughs> So, you know, for the for the benefit of our listeners, and I have a little knowledge about it, but not all that much, actually. Uh, tell us about transpersonal psychology and, and also more generally sort of spiritual psychology as opposed sure. to whatever would be considered traditional psychology. Sure. Transpersonal psychology started back in the uh, late 60s with the work of, well, actually, it started with William James, but that's in the 1800s. It so in the, back, 60s, yeah. in the late 70s. Um, there were people like Abraham Laszlo, Stan Groff. People were um, up in the zeitgeist of the time, all the lookings at Eastern religion and humanistic psychology. And before psychedelics became illegal, they were trying to use psychedelic drugs for healing and doing some research on that. And all of these interests outside of mainstream psychology came together and said, we want to study not only mainstream psychology, but also spirituality. Mm. And mainstream psychology at the time pretty much said, well, that's a bunch of woo-woo and that's new age strange stuff. And we were like, well, we think it's um, a valid part of human development. And maybe it's the higher reaches of human development or the more expanded sense of self. So transpersonal psychology has continued to evolve as we study mainstream psychology, but we don't think that's enough. We think there's also spiritual search, unusual experiences people have. You know, we study people who have experiences with, who believe they have experiences with UFOs or ghosts, or we think that how interesting that people would have these experiences. We don't necessarily say if we agree with them or not, but we say it's an interesting part of human experience. Mm -hmm. We study um, uh, psychedelics and all these kinds of uh, ways of expanded consciousness. Yeah, it's interesting because a lot of the things you're describing, as I recall, you know, from my learning about psychology way back in the, probably in the Lincoln administration, I think, I mean, <laughs> not quite that far back. But, you know, there certainly was, I mean, actually, even more recently than my learnings, there was a trend there for quite a while and still is in some places that if you can't measure it and can't observe it externally, it's not worth studying. It isn't really science. Oh. And so that would rule out even things as weird as as common as feelings, but certainly it would it would rule out people's descriptions of their own experiences as valid subjects of study. And you're saying no, actually, people's descriptions of their experiences, including things like spiritual experience and and you know other than easily explainable experience, those are worthy of study and worthy of deeper understanding. Is that do I understand what you're That's saying? That's exactly right. You know, I thought of this. Um analogy the other day it's like if you go out on a weekend and you hike to the top of a, a beautiful hike and you have a beautiful vista and you kind of have one of those cosmic experiences like oh everything's right with the world and it's just so you just kind of have that moment where it seems timeless and you just we call this a peak experience mm -hmm. you go back to work on monday and people say what did you what happened over the weekend you have to say i went hiking Mm, yeah yeah <laughs> you know there's no place in our society really unless you're in a small group of like-minded people that just say oh wow i had this cosmic experience mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah I, i've written about uh what i the term i often use in my work and i mean it in a very general sense is faith and by faith i'm not referring to a specific religious understanding i'm referring to a mindset that among other things would allow for the validity of that sort of experience it would say yeah that's worthy of of thought. You know what occurred to me as you were saying, describing that that sense of what would you say to somebody who saw you climbing a mountain, you know? I was thinking of um Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who died a number of years ago. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he was very big in, in the Jewish world. And he was to talk about how if if aliens came and visited and watched people playing, let's say a baseball game, although he probably would have said cricket, I imagine, but he was British. Um <laughs> watch people playing a baseball game. If they watched long enough, they could probably figure out the rules of baseball. But what they couldn't figure out is why anybody cares. <laughs> they, they couldn't figure out, okay, I, I get, I understand what happens, what, when, and we figure, you know, we've inferred that from all the data, but why do people cheer? Or why oh, do they yeah. seem happy or sad when certain things happen? That's about meaning. And that's not contained in the data in the same way. And I think a lot of the stuff involving understanding someone's peak experience is a lot about the meaning they take from it, which isn't, it doesn't show up in the measurements. Even, you know, you could measure their 
blood oxygen and you could measure there all sorts of things you could even do brain scans but you wouldn't really find meaning in there you'd find what's associated with what i may am i on the exactly. right track that's exactly yeah. right and what we find in transpersonal psychology is we're very interested in the personal meaning that the subjective experience and mainstream science and, and psychology mainstream psychology is really positioning itself as we are a science and we want only objective data and we're mm. like, um, human beings are much more complex than that. We have meaning. We have faith that don't make sense rationally. But, and yet that is a valid, perhaps the most interesting to me and many other people, that's perhaps the most interesting thing about us. Yeah. Now, in the realm of sex, for example, mainstream sexology has come a long way. Uh, it's really about measuring and uh, telling us how often we should have sex and how long it should last. And uh, why does it go down when we get older, which I think all three of us know it doesn't have to necessarily. Mm -hmm. And what are the statistics about it and what should you do? And here's how you should be having sex if you're normal and so on. And this totally leaves out, you know, I just did a, for my doctoral program, I just did a review of all the journals. Uh, I think it was 13 journals since inception. And I have to, tell you, it was quite shocking to see there were very few articles in the sexological journals about relationship, about meaning, mm. about love, about affection, mm. nothing about spirituality. So that uh, to me is the most inter interesting thing about sex is not how long it lasts or what the measurements are, but, and I guess I'm in a privileged position that I don't have to worry about those things, but what is the meaning? What is, what's the nature of the relationship? Uh, how does it make love, um, et cetera? So these more transpersonal elements are really, I think, the of the most value. Yeah. You'd think from the late 70s when you saw spiritual sex that it would have, would have come a little bit farther since then, but it sounds like it hasn't. Not in the mainstream literature, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, there are, uh, there's a certain rise amongst educated people who live on uh, the West Coast, probably in Tantra, of a certain brand of Tantra that we could call Western Tantra, but it's a very small percentage of the population. And I know Facebook will still, Facebook and Amazon will still both uh, prohibit you from using the word Tantra. Yeah. Oh, really? Using the word Tantra at all? Yep. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, we we are as as a culture, we are kind of messed up when it comes to sex. This is a story I've told in this podcast before, but a couple of years ago I did a training. I was, you know, we have to get continuing education, as I'm, I'm sure you know. And so I was involved, I was sitting in on a training, uh, and it was a bunch of people, it was it was about couples therapy. Mm -hmm. And the trainer asked, and it was on Zoom, so there was like a couple of hundred people there. Nice. And um, the trainer asked, okay, how many of you routinely ask about sex in the first or second session? And I'm thinking, well, duh, of course, right? And it was about, what was it? What if I had been saying 30%, something like that? It was about 30% said yes. And uh, lots of other people were saying, oh, no, no, I wait till they bring it up. Or I'll I'll only ask about it if, you know, if something comes up specific, but mm. it's not, you know, they'll ask generally about everything else, but they won't ask about sex lives. And it, of course, has a lot to do with the fact that the therapists themselves are afraid to talk about it. Exactly. They're uncomfortable. Yeah. Well, you yeah. can't talk about that. Well, I can't. I can't. I wrote an erotic <laughs> book and I'm not allowed to advertise that on Facebook or any of the uh, exactly. social media outlets either. So I yeah. know what you're saying. Exactly. Really nice book too. Put them, put, can't, can't resist putting in a plug. <laughs> we, we usually do in our, plug in, the intro. in our intro and outro, we usually plug, but that's Judy's book. Right, it tells from the Bible. That sounds very fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. It's, it's actually uh, not just not allowed to advertise it on yeah. social media. Sure. <laughs> it incorporates actually a lot of traditional stories out of, out of Midrash, Jewish Midrash, uh, and she just <laughs> literally and figuratively fleshed out the details. So <laughs> it's sounds uh, great. But again, yeah. Yeah. So there's so many things that are on social media that are shocking and um, harmful and aggressive and uh, bad for us. And yet beautiful stories of, of people's erotic lives are not allowed. So right. it's, yeah. just, right. um, it's a bit baffling. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is a, a strange situation. So how do you help folks 
you know, and actually I'm curious if you could tell us about tantric. I, I love those, those <laughs> three titles. dating, mating and relating. You know? <laughs> and, and how do you work with folks? You know, when, when a couple comes to you or individuals come to you, like, tell us about that. So my books, I, um, I was single. Uh, I've been married twice before. I was not good at relationships, even though I was a marriage and family therapist, I still wasn't getting it myself. Mm. And I had a major birthday and I decided this is the one part of my life I haven't gotten and I'm going to get it. So I started on this intensive plan that I was going to find my third husband and it was going to be perfect, which by the way, it happened. Ah. So, but I started dating and I started trying to um, incorporate my, the, what I'd learned at the ashram and what I learned through Tantra in dating, which contemporary dating is about the opposite of that. Contemporary dating, a lot of the reasons people don't find somebody is because the uh, dating process, as it's taught to us in the contemporary world, is teaching us to be less and less loving. Mm. We see someone on the app, we don't like the way we look, we discard them, we put them in the garbage, we put people in the garbage, yeah. and we're, we're taught to become more and more specific on what we're looking for. And I like to tell people, if I had seen my husband on an app, I wouldn't have chosen him. Mm. But thank God I met him in person. So I started um, trying to show up because in Tantra, everybody's perfect just the way they are. I'm the one who can't see that. Ah, interesting. I'm the one who can't see that. So if I don't see someone in front of me as perfect, I have some spiritual work to do because God made this person or some people don't like the word God, but the universe made this person and I have judgmental glasses on. Mm -hmm. So I would try to show up on these dates. And that doesn't mean that everyone's going to be my perfect mm. love, but I would try to show up on these dates and watch my own judgmentalness and try to get into a position of love with this person. I don't mm -hmm. mean in love, but I mean, I value you as a human being. Thank you for having coffee with me for an hour. I don't think we're a match, but I can genuinely say I enjoyed meeting you. Right. You know, it's Keep interesting. One of the things you're saying, I'm realizing as you're saying it, in my work as a therapist, be it individuals or couples, it's a very similar mindset. I And I hadn't thought of that until you just said that. But, you know, it's that it is that mindset that I better love the people I work with, not in some sense that I'm going to you know pair up with them. I mean, right. it's not a sexual exactly. interest, but in terms of genuinely accepting that they are the right the, the right to be who they are, which is, again, that's kind of another way of defining how I use the word faith. It's a mindset that says reality is right to be what it is. And that means you're indeed, you're perfect to be who you are. That's and if what I, I would call a tantric yeah. philosophy. If you don't want yeah. that word, that's fine. But it's that essence of the universe is right. Yeah, that's wow. That is very much the definition. I, I'll have to start m noting that when I talk about <laughs> faith. It's like, I just found out that some people, that's that's what people use tantra for. I mean, that word tantra. I mean, I've I've heard the word and we've actually interviewed uh, several other people who've you know been into tantra but uh hadn't thought of it in those terms it's just pretty much what i call faith mm -hmm. well originally tantra said everything is holy including sex and the the other half of the or the three quarters of the world were like no sex is not holy it's like okay mm -hmm. well you guys are bad because you think sex is sacred also mm -hmm. so um i wrote the tantra dating book and I just kind of put it out as um, I had been giving a talk on it and I transcribed some of the uh, talks that I gave and I kind of put this book out. I was, wasn't really thinking it was going to do much. I put it up on Amazon. It started selling. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what? <laughs> and then <laughs> it was during the pandemic. And I noticed that people were consuming content in uh, series. Uh, so yeah. I like to watch the Queen's Gambit or uh -huh. the Crown or whatever. And I thought... It's the pandemic. I'm stuck at home. What if I write two more little books the same size? Uh -huh. And it worked. They're best uh -huh. sellers on Amazon in the in their category. So, <laughs> so that's I really cool. Them. That's <laughs> great. Yeah. They, um, I wrote some tantric principles in there, and it seems that um, it's been valuable for people. Mm -hmm. So, like, what are some of those principles? I mean, in addition to what you said about you know starting with that mindset that. We're all right to be who we are. What what else would you say? Well, in terms of couples and couples therapy, it's also my job to see that my partner is perfect. And that's going to come up all the time because I don't really think he is or here's his flaws or um, this is my relationships in the past was really kind of looking unconsciously, but kind of looking for what's wrong with the other person and then letting them know they should fix that. Mm. <laughs> that's not a very successful strategy. <laughs> 
<laughs> but I see what, it all. What was the, the name of that play? I, I love you. You're perfect. Now change. Right. Yeah, that, was, <laughs> that was a Broadway play a couple of decades ago. That's perfect. That's yeah. perfect. So I kind of start with couples by bringing them back to what's that heart connection. Mm. So we used to do exercises at the ashram where we would sit and stare into each other's eyes for I don't know how long it was because it gets very timeless, but maybe it was 20 minutes. And everyone would be crying like babies because you cannot help but fall in love with someone if you really look deeply into their eyes. Mm. Who they are drops away and you're just in love with this person. So I often with couples in the first session, if it seems right, we'll ask them to just look at each other and they may not have looked at each other for a long time mm -hmm. and they'll just come back because when you really look in someone's eyes the heart opens and they remember and I, maybe I'll kind of guide them to remember what that connection is without all the stuff that's come up through the years or with all that stuff we think is wrong with the other person all of our hurts and wounds and we just connect and we remember that we have the special bond and once they can remember that, if they can, some if they can't, then actually I haven't had anybody yet who hasn't been able to, but uh, um, even if it's just for that moment, and then we will start to say, what's going on? What are the issues? Just like we would in regular uh, couples therapy, but I would ask about sex in the first session and really see that as a way that we always have available to connect. Mm -hmm. We don't necessarily have to have intercourse or do a whole ritual or anything like that what we can just start by touching affectionately maybe laying uh nude together just cuddling or many ways we can connect remember that we're sexual beings uh even if we're feeling distant at this moment we can start with those small connections mm -hmm. yeah it's interesting I, I work with a lot of couples and it actually just just met another one the other day where and this is relatively unusual, but not, you know, not unheard of, where they will say, the one thing we have going for us now is sex. Mm. You know, usually if if their life in general is kind of all messed up and there's been infidelity or other kinds of betrayals of one kind or another, they won't say that. They'll say, oh, yeah, well, we, we had a sex life ages ago, but, you know, but every once in a while I will meet a couple and they'll say, no, that's about what we have that's that's our remaining connection. We, hmm. we fight. Other than that, we fight all the time. Other than that, we have all these difficulties. But at least we can still connect sexually. And sometimes that is a way back to hmm. each other. Yes. And sometimes it isn't. You know, sometimes they come to recognize, well, we are two fine people and we're even sexually compatible, but not in any other way. And that may hmm. you know, tends not to work. So that does that well. does that happen in your sessions where? Couples are lying with each other naked and touching. Oh, no, not something? at all. Okay. Not at all. Uh, since the pandemic, I only work over the internet. Uh -huh. So that would be something more that I would recommend for uh, homework. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, just suggest that they get back to trying to cuddle. Mm -hmm. um, because in Tantra, we don't want to uh, actually have sex unless we're feeling really friendly towards the other person. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. We want to establish that I'm safe with you. Um, you're my best friend. And, you know, like the Gottman say, you want to, if something's wrong, you want to start with the friendship level. And I really agree with that. And my Tantra training really agrees with that. It's like, um, you, you have the best sex with your best friend. Mm -hmm. This whole idea that they're two separate things, we don't, we don't buy into that at all. Mm -hmm. So we might start by establishing the friendship. That's why it would just be maybe laying together, cuddling, soft touches um not going into what conventional not going into the conventional model of you know wham bam thank you <laughs> bam or sir <laughs> <laughs> I'm, that's very interesting bruce i just wonder uh how you work with a couple that's connected sexually but not any other way yeah i mean well i, I work with them pretty similarly to other folks a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of ways I suppose I could describe how I work, but a lot of it is sort of sniffing out meaning. You know, a lot of it is sort of understanding, first of all, opening up possibilities for different understandings. And, you know, I I, I always like to, um, or often like to mention Jill Bolte-Taylor. Do you know who she is? Mm -hmm. you, you may recognize the uh, her viral video is called My Stroke of Insight. Yeah. Uh, she's a neuroscientist 
who uh, in her 30s, she's now in her, I guess in her 60s now, in her, she's probably, yeah, somewhere in your, so. your age range. Um, the uh, when, when she was in her mid 30s, she had a, a severe left hemisphere hemorrhagic stroke. And it kind of wiped out most of the functions of her left hemisphere for a number of years. Who better than a neuroscientist to then write about that? Well, one of the things she then discovered in, in getting back her left hemisphere was how optional getting pissed off is, for example. And what she noted, she so her first book was called My Stroke of Insight. She talked all about that experience. Her second book, which was many years later, just came out a few years ago, was called Whole Brain Living. And her whole idea is that we are all multiple people, mm -hmm. just in terms of brain structures. We are at least four different people. And she gives them funny <laughs> names for herself, suggests that we give them funny names for ourselves. I remember I asked you what what you would call your four. You remember what right. you said? John Paul, George, and Ringo. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. It totally made sense. And and you know, there's something to it. It's like that that the fact that the Beatles were how they were was a lot because they all did kind of represent these different aspects of a person. You know, it was kind of neat that way. So that phenomenon that we are multiple people is this relates to that your question about well, what do you do with folks who are they're only connecting sexually? They're the 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 most um the most connection they're experiencing consciously may be sexual, but there's all this other stuff going on that doesn't get a lot of airtime. And I, I invite them to sort of investigate some of those other aspects of who they are, because, you know, whatever their narrative is, and here I'm, I'm falling back in my old training in narrative therapy back in the day, whatever narrative is going on is not the only possible story. Right. It's, it may be dominant. It may be problematic because it's so dominant, but there are other possibilities that exist that often get sort of, you know, um, pushed out by the dominant narrative. Hmm. So that was curious. kind of, yeah. yeah. I'm very curious about that. You know, um, shoot, isn't it? Schnark. Yeah. Uh, David, David Schnark. Yes. Schnark he died that, a few years ago, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I miss him. Not that I knew him, but I liked him being on the planet. He talks about that intimacy is more frightening for people than death. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder if you're only connecting with your partner sexually, if you're really having intimate sex. I, I'm guessing not. I'm for guessing the very not. Reason, yeah, because, it, and it's funny, I wrote a chapter in one of my books called Sex, Good Sex, and Sacred Sex. Nice. And, and what I call good sex, really, would it would be intimate sex. So in other words, plain old sex is whatever you think it is, and it's, it's the physical stuff. Yeah. Good sex is when you actually show up. So that's intimate sex, when you actually show up physically, spiritually, emotionally, and present. Sacred sex is when you are then able to get outside of yourselves, actually. It's sacred sex when it's it's not just about the two of you anymore. Yeah, you the know, divine about, enters. Yeah, connection with, with much bigger forces. So I'm just wondering with that couple, if you could encourage them while they're making love to take a moment and look in each other's eyes, mm. take a moment and connect through their hearts. Mm -hmm. I wonder if their sex life would fall apart or if they could reach their intimacy that way. It's an interesting question because. Yeah. Once and you not what I thought of it's, I mean, you know, you're, you're giving me some, some things to think about here because I haven't thought in those terms of saying, gee, when you're having sex, are there ways you connect in ways beyond just that, that physical, you know, immediate connection. Yeah, because what I find, especially with younger people that have grown up with porn, mm. all the uh, incessant porn, is that they really see that they're they're really taught, it's no one's fault, but they're being taught that they're kind of using the partner to get off. Mm -hmm. Right. So you give me an orgasm, I give you an orgasm. And I've had some couples that have come in like this and their relationships are not really working because it's not an intimacy model. Mm -hmm. So if they're kind of, if there's this sort of, um, exchange of we're here to service each other's orgasm. That's not going to promote intimacy. In fact, it's probably going to do the opposite and encourage mm -hmm. people to not uh, come to each other for warmth and caring. Mm -hmm. If you can make a gross generalization like that, but um, yeah, sounds sounds a little painful and cold. It mm -hmm. does. Yeah, yeah. Some of what you're saying is also reminding me of Sue Johnson's work. You know, in uh, emotional, emotionally focused therapy, and she she also just died recently. Yeah, a few months ago. Oh, she did. Ago. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, she died. I forgot when it was. It's yeah, a few months, think. something like that. Yeah, yeah. she's pretty young, uh, I would think. But she, you know, of course, her work focuses in very similar ways to that sense of, you know, finding the heart connection. It's not not just about, you know, the the um, mutual 
sort of uh, contract, you know, saying mutual benefit contract. It's also about a heart connection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah. So I try to help couples remember that and get back to that place where that still lives. If it doesn't still live, then maybe it's maybe it's over. But mm -hmm. I'm, uh, the couples I have worked with have been able to reconnect with that place. Doesn't necessarily mean it saves the marriage, but it does bring them back to that place where, oh, I remember you. To me, that feels like it's on a spiritual level. Mm -hmm. Like We know each other spiritually, even if our personalities are having trouble getting along. Yeah. For most of us, uh, our personalities uh, need a lot of work to be able to be in a really healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. So we need to go to therapy or uh, now there's so much good stuff on the internet for personal and spiritual growth and just however people want to work on themselves to help themselves grow into more loving people. Mm -hmm. And I think that if they can uh, reconnect with that spiritual thing you can't define where we have something special, you know, when you fall in love or when you're getting married to someone or, or not getting married to someone, but you have that thing that this is my person, this is really special. If you can reconnect to that, feels like a spiritual connection, then the rest of the stuff can be worked on. Yeah. I've noted the one thing that I'll, I've, I've said to couples, you know, there are three of us in the conversation, me and the couple, and I say, well, the one thing I know about all three of us is we're all annoying. <laughs> 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 and and we're of course we're all annoying and so one of the you know the relationship skills one needs is the ability to be mildly annoyed and that, I you know, like that's that. what I claim is the solution to all of all relationship problems the ability to be mildly annoyed you know I, I like and I, I often say I mean you're not annoying but I God knows I know I am and, <laughs> and you're very gracious Judy's very good at being mildly annoyed with me because God knows I'm annoying you know and she's very nice about it so that's it's fine that's why we get along you know <laughs> That phenomenon, actually, I was also thinking about another thing that uh, David Schnarch wrote about a lot. And I, it's, I've gone, I've been saying this for years too, and I got a lot of that from his work. Um, tolerating anxiety is the key to intimacy. The chief skill like of intimacy that. is tolerating anxiety rather than avoiding it. I like that. And precisely because, you know, if you think about those couples that are trying to find that heart connection and that that sacred connection that they have, in the presence of the fact, I mean, not to trivialize it, but just being annoying, there's that. And then there are <laughs> things that are way more than annoying. There's things like betrayals. I just wrote a book about betrayals. Mm. You know, the the fact of, and I actually am sort of curious if you work with folks, you know, I, my, um, my naive guess, and I could be wrong about this, my naive guess is that people aren't going to someone like you talk, who are talking about, you know, tantric relating if they've just if they're dealing with infidelity or something like that, I could be quite wrong about that. I'm curious. Do you get folks who are dealing with big betrayals of that sort? Um, since I came out of the closet about being a Tantra person, no, you're right. No. Those yeah. people are not. I used to see them when I was um, earlier in my career, when I was keeping all that stuff kind of hidden and I was taking insurance and, and I would uh, work with people with those kind of betrayals. But um, I don't know that I have that much insight about that other than that thing we're taught in school, which is that, the infidelity is a symptom, mm -hmm. something going on with a couple versus the problem in itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and the thing I like to add to that, that idea is usually, because usually. every once in a while, it's not. It's really sort of interesting. Every once in a while, there's someone who, you know, in another culture, like guys I've met who really seem to be genuinely loving their wives or, you know, loving their girlfriends, whatever, but in another culture would probably have three or four wives and be nice to all of them. And they just aren't cut out for monogamy. And I, I'm not, I'm not cynical on the subject of monogamy. I think, no, lots of people are, I, I, I am for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, that's who I am, but there are plenty of people who aren't. And that's, it, it isn't about, you know, it isn't about like, well, what was wrong with the couple? Well, nothing except that if the other person was looking for monogamy, you're not going to get it from this guy, <laughs> you know, you're right. I think that's kind of naive what I said, because actually I am working with one client who it's cultural for him to not make love to his wife, but to see prostitutes. And if he oh, starts wow. doing that, his guy friends start thinking there's something wrong with him because in his culture, that's how you do it. The, wow. wives, are, the wives are pristine and uh, not sexual. And they like go you can have babies with them or something, right? They can, babies, they can make babies. But they're that's wonderful. You love your wife. Yeah. You know? You say great things about her, but for your sexual needs, you go uh, to prostitutes. He calls them the ladies. Huh. And then I do, because of um, the Tantra label, I do see people who are 
have attempted to be polyamorous, but mm -hmm. they haven't really defined it well enough. So the partner mm -hmm. ends up getting hurt because there aren't really clear boundaries around yeah. what that means. Yeah, I see that more and more as it's become more part of the people actually talk about it now. And we just and had spoken yeah. with any number of uh, counselors in that field. One of our we just, spoke we to just let last week we the uh, the the uh, episode we released last mm -hmm. week was with somebody who's who helps people with polyamory. Yeah, it's it's complicated. And she herself is <laughs> and she right polyamorous. Yeah, I, I forgot how many boyfriends she said she had. Four. Four. Yeah, four <laughs> boyfriends. Yeah. Oh my gosh, how do you get anything done? You know, it's <laughs> what I wanted. Some we one of the other folks we talked about this a few months ago pointed out that Google Calendar turns out to be really important in, in managing polyamorous relationships. <laughs> It's just I'm just sure. the logistics. <laughs> you know, I can't it's, even mention it, but but uh, you know, fifty nine and it's four oh one. Well, it does. You know, sort of reminds me some of the biblical story, although that wasn't exactly polyamory. The biblical story of Jacob, who you know, Leah came out and said, no, Rachel came out and said, I get you tonight. I just purchased you for you know. For mandrakes, right? Am I well, Leah gave, out, story? Leah gave Rachel the mandrake. That's what it was. And yeah. she said, I get you tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's like, very spicy. It was already, oh, the Bible's full of spicy. There's no. <laughs> to go too far to write that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good heavens. Yeah. That was, that's one of the least, <laughs> the least of it. Yeah. Uh, but no, just that phenomenon. It's like, yeah, it's really complicated to, uh, well, that, you know, in, uh, Certainly in Jewish culture, mm -hmm. at least among Ashkenazim, they outlawed, it was about a thousand years ago, they outlawed poly uh, polygamy, polygamy. Yeah. because it was just way, way too complex. The, the The rabbi who wrote that decree was having a hard time with his two wives. And I think that was part of the story. <laughs> it's like, nah, we, sh we just shouldn't do this anymore. Yeah. So what else should we be asking you about? Um, I do some, uh, my husband and I do some, well, one thing I want to talk about is that um, my husband and I had some transpersonal sexual experiences when we met. So we had some sort of mystical experiences while we we're making love. And this really catapulted me into wanting to study people who have had these kind of mystical experiences. There's actually some good articles on uh, uh, a Christian and uh, people from I'm not, I'm not sure if it's the Jewish tradition as well, but they've asked pe faith-based people also, um, does God come in while you're making love? Mm. And there's not a lot of studies on it, but there's very compelling evidence that a sizable minority of people will say yes. Oh, I'd if say yes. There's three people <laughs> making love. God comes in yeah. and is the third party. Mm -hmm. And so my husband and I had some uh, experiences like that when we first met, and they lasted for a year and a half. So I went back. That's one reason I'm getting my doctor just try to study more about this thing that's completely not spoken about. Mm -hmm. And um, one thing that we noticed was connecting that intimately and deeply and being open, as you would say, in a faith based way to inviting the divine into our lovemaking. We turned before we met, we were both people who had not been very good at relationships. Mm -hmm. And we we're both kind of hoping we would find something that wasn't as bad as before. <laughs> that was our don't start. we all <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a start <laughs> and instead we have this perfect relationship mm -hmm. and i think be, spending that much time in the presence of of an expanded reality of love of faith of d divine sexuality it it helped us evolve as people to really be able to see my partner as a manifestation of the divine and treat him so. And, you know, I was kind of annoying before. I'm sure, <laughs> sure I can still be annoying, but I'm less so uh, uh, having by going through these experiences of tantric sex, of mm -hmm. making love in a way where the divine is invited. And it's not just for getting off, it's for experiencing this uh expanded reality that being making love with a person can bring you to mm -hmm. and i really want to share this uh, message with anyone who wants to listen which is that there's there's higher purpose for sex if you want it to be if you want to just use it to get off that's perfectly fine it's obviously fun and enjoyable and if you want to take it a little further it can actually uh have a healing effect on your relationship mm -hmm. 
can have, have a healing effect on you and on your uh, love making. I remember one time uh, Greg and I were making love and I said, oh my God, this is why they call it love making. Because mm -hmm. we are literally making love. And I just kind of thought I was making love before I saw, oh, this process actually makes more love between the couple. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that you were able to experience that because he, he, both you and he were open to it, whereas past lovers or past partners didn't have that same feeling or thought or belief that you have? I believe I'm really still investigating that. I'm not sure why this happened to us, <laughs> but we had both been open to these kind of experiences before. Mm hmm. We had both been open. We both had faith, as you would say. We both had had peak experiences before. So um, they do say in the research that people who have had peak experiences are more likely to have them again. Yeah. I think because we both were so uh, open and looking for somebody and we're both spiritual people and we'd had uh, peak experiences before, I think, I don't know. I don't know if we were chosen or I don't know what happened. Still a mystery, but... Uh -huh. A great mystery and hopefully something that uh, can help other people as well. Mm -hmm. Well, wow. well, that's a nice note to end on. Yes, it is. Uh, tell tell folks how they can reach you. Um, I am in all the usual places. I'm on social media, Instagram, Facebook. I have a, a large YouTube channel if you want to get some little hits of stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, my website is my name, katherineallman.com. I also have a newsletter you can sign up for, all kinds of stuff. So I would love to share with you if that would be useful to you. And I will put that information in the session notes, in the session notes, in the episode notes. <laughs> Talk like a therapist, don't I? In the episode notes for this uh, this podcast. Well, thank you so much for doing thank this. Thank you, Catherine. So much. It's been a pleasure. Welcome back. We hope you enjoyed that interview with Catherine Amon and learned about dating, mating, and relating in the tantric world. Absolutely. And so uh, her information will be in the notes for this episode. Mm -hmm. uh, and D gee, what else should we say? Buy our books. Let people know about this podcast. Would you give us a rating and follow. a review and follow and tell just your friends all of the above? Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. And still and so until next time, remember, be kind, don't panic and have faith.